Good morning. Good to see everyone out this morning. I'd like to wish all you mothers happy Mother's Day. And praise the Lord for the opportunity to be in the Lord's house. Amen. I'm thankful. God's been good to me. Uh, Brother Ronnie Crane, would you lead us in prayer, please? Yes. Amen. Folks, good to be here. We've got some young folks that's going to come down this morning. Open that door, brother, and let them in. She cleans my clothes. I love my mommy because she she loves me. my mom because she provides for me and takes care of me. She's very pretty. (laughs) I love my mom because she loves me. I love my mom because she helps me with my homework and she's smart and sweet. Smart, caring, kind, and she fends for my every need. I love my mom because she cuddles me. And I love my mom because she is, shares the gospel with me. I just said something. <laughs> I, I, lo- I love my mom because she takes care of me and she loves me.
Well, that's good. I tell you what, if we just if if that's all we got today, we got a good dose. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. That's good. Uh, and that amazing grace that went right with our Sunday school lesson this morning. It's like it was just put together, wasn't it? If you would stand, get your All American Church hymnal. Let's turn to page number eighty-four, Mansion Over the Hilltop. <laughs> I am satisfied with just a cottage below, a little silver and a little gold. But in that city where the ransom will shine, I want a gold one. That silver line I've got a mansion Just over the hilltop In that bright land Where we'll never grow old And someday yonder We'll never more Walk on streets that are pure as gold Though often tempted, tormented and tested And like the prophet, my pillow was stone And though I find here no permanent dwelling I know he'll give me a mansion my own got a mansion just over the hilltop in that bright land where we'll never grow old and some Yonder will never more wander, but walk on streets that are pure as gold. Don't think me poor or deserted or lonely. I'm not discouraged. I'm the pilgrim in search of that city I want a mansion a harp and a crown I've got a mansion just over the hilltop in that bright land where we'll never grow Someday yonder We'll never more wander But walk on streets That are pure as gold Won't be a room, folks. It'll be a mansion. Lord bless you. Be Amen. Amen. If they give me a harp, somebody's going to have to teach me how to use it. Amen. Good to be here. Good to have all of you with us this fine Mother's Day. Maybe the good Lord's going to give us some good weather out here for today. Amen, amen. Mother's Day, we've set aside a special day to recognize our mothers. Loved it when these little children came up. Yes. Wasn't that wonderful? Yes. Amen. That's wonderful. We'd like to welcome, if you're visiting with us today, first time, we'd like for you to raise your hand and we'll give you a card and let you fill it out. Drop in the plate and it passes in a moment. All right, right here on the third row back. We have somebody with us first Amen. time. Anybody else back on the back back there? Amen. All right. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Here on the third, where are you from? Here on. Uh, I came, I drove down from Minnesota. It's not where I'm from, but I just came from Minnesota. Okay, okay, good. 
You got glory on your shirt there, Doxa. Ah, uh, that's just the cleanest shirt I had. Well, that's all right. <laughs> that's Greek. <laughs> all right, back in the back here. Where are you from? Florida. Where? Florida. Florida. All right. Minnesota, Florida. Long way between the two. Yes, ma'am. Kingston, well, good to have you. God bless you, amen. Well, it's good to be here. Meet again this evening, six o'clock for the evening service. And y'all keep that in mind. If you got a mother today, if your mother's still alive, hug her today. Amen. Tell her you love her because you may not have her this time next year. Don't ever take your mom for granted, amen. Okay, brother. I'd like to invite the choir up this morning. We'll be singing out of the All-American Church, hymnal page number 124. Are you washed in the blood? All that will come and sing. do this a little bit different this morning since it's Mother's Day. If you would stand, get your All-American Church hymnal, page uh, 392. We're going to do this first verse. We're going to let the pianoist start us off. Ladies only. We're going to get them, get them started. Ladies sing that as unto the Lord. Thank you for being a mother. Thank you for bringing these children into our lives. I thank God for them. But we'll start off with that on the second verse. Everybody will join in just like we normally sing. So 
Go ahead, sister. Everybody, the dying thief, rejoice to see that mountain in his day. And there may I, though I
bless you and be seated as the choir comes down. It's a term used in the Bible. It's called the virgin daughter of Zion. It's used to, I suppose, to compare Israel with the rest of the world because it is there that God ordained what a family is about. And he told them how a family should operate, how they should be, how they should relate to each other. If you want to know where aunts and uncles and brothers and sisters and all of that came from, came straight out of the Old Testament Jewish Bible. Amen. Amen. we are preaching about that in a minute. We'll recognize our mothers in here this morning, though. Would you stand this morning? All the mothers, would you stand up here? We've got something for you out in the foyer. We want you to know that, and we want to give you a hand. <laughs> and before this day's over, if you're, if you're here with your mother, let her know that you appreciate her burying you for nine months and giving you life. Amen. That she didn't kill you. That you're alive. Amen. I mean, she may have wanted to a few times after you were born, but uh, she let you live. Amen. All right, let's have the ushers come up. We'll take up the morning offering. Brother Barry, lead us in prayer, please. Father, we thank you for a most beautiful day. Thank you for those that allow us this time to come to your house, Lord. Lord, I pray for every mother that's here today. I thank you, Lord, for my mother that I've lost. Thank you, Lord. Please come in here and be with us all today, Lord. Uh, talk to your brother Watson and Linda and all those ladies. Thank you, Lord. Just put them back in. Amen.
music, folks. Uh, we have this morning Brooklyn and Dakota. Going to be singing for us. beautiful song. Jacqueline says we've got a little one's going to uh, quote some scripture for us. Amen. Folks, there's nothing better that they could learn.
Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Good. All right. If you have your Bibles, I'd like for you to turn with me this morning, the book of uh, 2 Timothy, chapter number 3, and verse 15. <laughs> 2 Timothy 3, 15. The Apostle Paul is addressing young Timothy, his son in the, old, in the faith, he called him. And in 2 Timothy 3, 15, he said this, from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation, through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Then look at 2 Timothy 1 5. 2 Timothy 1 5. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, I am persuaded that in thee also. Father, bless this book now. Your name I pray, amen. You can be seated. Now, of course, we're talking about a young boy that was raised in the Jewish faith, absolute, complete Jewish faith. He had a Greek father. So therefore, and we have no indication the father is anything more than just simply a Greek pagan, that's all. And he had nothing to do with the instruction of his, of his son in learning about God because he knew nothing of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. But his grandmother and his mother did. And from a child, they began to teach Timothy. And when you uh, look just a little bit into what we're talking about as to what they taught. So what did they teach? Well, they taught, first of all, the Shema. We find that in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 6, verse 4 through 9. This is what they taught their children as they grew up. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. That was the foundation and basis of everything they believed. There is one God, not many, just one, one God. And then they taught them the Hallel. We find that in Psalm 113. So what is that? Well, it means praise, the word Hallel. And it is associated with hallelujah, praise Jehovah. In Psalm 113, it says this, Praise you the Lord. Praise, O ye servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, the Lord's name is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations, his glory above the heavens. Who is like unto the Lord our God who dwelleth on high? Listen, who humbleth himself to behold the things that are in heaven and in the earth. He raiseth up the poor out of the dust, lifteth the needy out of the dunghill, that he may set him with princes, even with the princes of his people. He maketh the barren woman to keep house and to be a joyful mother of children. Praise ye the Lord. Amen. Imagine learning that as a child and you grow up. You've heard the Shema, you've learned it, and now the Hillel. And here's something in here. I want you to notice what he says in verse 6. Who humbleth himself to behold the things that are in heaven and in the earth. That's a loaded scripture. Then there's the Masuza. He grew up knowing this. So what's that, preacher? It is to remind the Jews of their obligation toward God. It was the scripture of Deuteronomy, chapter number 6, wrapped up and then placed over the doorpost. The word itself means doorpost. And it was important to the Jew as his coming in and his going out was all connected with the word of God. God goes forth with me. God brings me back to my home. Everything in his life daily, Jewish life, was a recognition of the hand of Almighty God upon him and everything that he was doing. This is how Timothy was raised. Then he came to the time when he had his bar mitzvah. 
If it was a girl, it is the, it is the uh, bat mitzvah. And what is this? It means the coming of age. It's a ceremony for Jewish boys and girls when they reach the age of 12 or 13. Luke chapter number 2 and verse number 42 says this. When he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And it came to pass after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. They would have done well to listen to this one that was sitting in their midst, for he was the author of the book that they, that they loved so much. And so, my dear friend, at 12 years of age, the Lord Jesus Christ had already reached that plateau that young children are raised up in. There he would have known the synagogue. What is the synagogue? The Greek word sunagoge, it means to gather together. It is a consecrated space used for the purpose of Jewish prayer, study, assembly, and reading of the Tanakh. The Tanakh means the entire complete Old Testament scriptures. The Navim, the Ketuvim, and the Torah, the three divisions of the Old Testament. He was raised in understanding this is the word of God. It is more important than anything else that I could possibly learn. My relationship with my father, my relationship with my mother will be strengthened and built upon what God said in his word. And that is so important. Alfred Edersheim in the life and times of Jesus the Messiah, which I highly recommend, Brother Edersheim was a converted Jew, and he was raised in this. He knew all. He knew what he was talking about, and he gives us the 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 names that they use for their children as they grow, and at certain ages as they grow on up into young adulthood, they have a name for that. It meant that they were watching their children as they grew. They're very concerned about who they were. The first one is Jaled. It means a newborn. Then there's Janak, which means literally a suckling. Then an Olel is still a suckling, but a little older. Then a Gamul is a weaned one. A Taf is a growing, stronger one that has been weaned. And then an Elam is becoming firm and strong. Nair or Nari is a youth, literally, one who shakes off and shakes free. You notice? Teenagers. Get to that point, they shake off, they shake free. They know it all by then, don't they? <laughs> and then finally a bakur, the ripened one. Now imagine people who watch their children grow through these successive stages. Brother Edersheim says this, Assuredly those who so keenly watched child life has to give a pictorial designation to each advancing stage of its existence must have been fondly attached to their children. The children, therefore, is the next generation, the foundation, for they well knew that God Almighty brought the woman to the man, and he ordained the first marriage, and that was the basis of civilization. And once you mess the marriage up, you'll never have civilization right again. We have mothers in Scripture. The Bible's full of mothers. I'd be here all day long if I tried to preach about all of them. But I'm going to talk about some of the bad ones first. Athaliah, for example. We read about her in the Old Testament. Her son was Ahaziah, one of the worst vile kings that Israel ever had. She rose up and killed all the seed royal. She was a murderer. Herodiah, Herodias, you know who she was. She was the one who called for John the Baptist head on a charger. What a woman. Then there's Lot's wife. Well, what about her, preacher? Lot's wife left her heart in Sodom. That's why she looked back, because that's where her heart was. Amen. I hope this morning, dear lady, that your heart is not in Sodom. We have good mothers, though, in the Bible. Rachel, for example, cried out and said, Lord, give me children. Give me children or I die. So God gave her Joseph. And Joseph, as, my, as you've heard said so many times, was probably the greatest type of Christ in all the Old Testament. So many things, so many. And God used Joseph in an amazing thing, how God withholds the blessing until you've cried unto him. And then once you cry out to God, the blessing comes. For Israel never had a greater blessing than Joseph. Because Joseph is the one who put a, gave him a place to live and eat while they were in Egypt. Then we have Hannah. 
Hannah is one of my heroes. Hannah. And as she cried out, Lord, if thou wilt, look upon thine handmaid. If you'll give me a son, a son, a man child, she said, I will give him back to you. I will dedicate him to you. And Hannah, of course, was saying that he's going to become a Nazarite. She, he's going to, be, he's going to help, come under the Nazarite vow, separate unto God from everything else. Now, friend, let me tell you something. When Joseph was born, that was a blessing from God. I don't see it any other way than to say to you, if you have children, that's a blessing from God. That's got to be a blessing from God. Your blessing is not your bank account. Your blessing's not your car. Your blessing's not your boat. It's not your job. It's these precious little children that you have. Then we have Rizpah. Most people never heard of Rizpah. She was Saul's concubine. You know, she didn't have a very high place in the family. She was a concubine. But you know what it says about her? Her son was put to death because of the sins of Saul. Her son was put to death and his body was laid up on a rock. The Bible tells us that Rizpah went to that rock and she drove away the carrion eaters. She, she would not allow them to come and eat the corpse of her son. My dear friend, I want to tell you right now, there are carrion eaters out there. Right there, out there. And they're coming after your children. And they want to eat them. And then finally there's mother, Mary, the mother of Christ. I say to you folks this morning, the Baptists have a problem with her. Listen to me carefully. She said, they shall call me blessed. And you should call Mary blessed. But she is not part of the Godhead. And you do not worship her. But you give her her rightful place. Amen. At the tomb, at the, at, the gra at, at the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, it was Mary that stood there and looked up at, the, at, the, at her dying son while he was hanging upon that tree. But when the Lord came to her and said, Thou uh, daughter of Zion, the virgin daughter of Zion that I'm talking about, he said, It has come to you that you shall bring forth a son. And he, she said, well, be it so unto thine handmaid. And she accepted God's will in her life. She raised up this little boy. But I wonder sometimes she pondered these things in her heart. When she was told about this, the Bible, she pondered these things. She thought them through. She meditated on it. And there's no doubt in my mind she probably thought, who, who have I got in my womb? I know I've got a child in my womb. But what's going on with me? Because nobody before her or since has ever carried God Almighty manifest in the flesh in her womb. But Mary did the day the child was born. They showed up and they worshiped him and they sang praises to God. And my friend, she stood there and she watched him draw his last and would have drawn his last breath. But John took her away. As the Lord Jesus said, behold thy mother, behold thy son. He took her away. But she was with him to the very end. And that's what mothers do. They stick with the children. The children know who they can trust. They should be able to. A mother should be that way. But I want you to look at something for just a moment, and that's life in the womb. Now, the only way I know anything about this, I have to research it, because I obviously I'm a male. And I have no problem this morning. I know what I am. <laughs> Let's get that straight. <laughs> no problem. <clears throat> life in the womb. I'm going to tell you something, folks. The reproductive system of a male and a female is, a, is, a, is, a, is, is an, un, it's an unbelievable thing. It is a remarkable thing. It's an intriguing thing when you study that. And I've done some reading into it. And I think to myself, you poor deluded fool. You think that evolved two totally separate sexual beings and it's necessary for them to come together for the human race, and you think that evolved? I feel sorry for you. It took the hand of God to do that. God's the only one that could do something like, listen carefully. Conception. A mother has that first moment of conception. She feels nothing. She knows nothing, for the most part, knows nothing about it. But a babe is being conceived in her womb. A life is starting in her womb. And from 13 to 16 weeks, Somewhere along in there, she feels movement. 13th, 16th week, somewhere in there. And the doctor calls that quickening. When that moment comes, quickening. When that baby begins to move in its womb, kick or move or whatever, but the mother feels it. And from that moment on, she no doubt feels in her soul, I've got a live human being inside me. 
I don't know how a man gets you. I don't feel about that, but a, mo a woman. Think about it, ladies. Think about it. What did you think when the first time you felt that baby kick inside your womb or you felt it move? Did you think, this is not me. This is another little person in here. This is a human being that I'm carrying in my womb, and that's the way it ought to be. And this business, this garbage about my body, it's not your body. It's the body of a little baby. But you've got a life inside you, a little human being. They say at five and a half to six weeks, they have an instrument now that can determine the heartbeat. Five and a half to six weeks, heartbeat. There's a heartbeat. It's not a glob, it's a heartbeat. There's a little baby in there and its heart's beating and they can hear it and they have the technology to do that now. They can hear that heartbeat. You must be excited because when the parent hears that, they think, my goodness, that's my baby's heartbeat. My baby is alive and its heart is beating. The ultrasounds today can show a perfectly formed 3D face. Ultrasounds have come a long way since the beginning. An ultrasound today can show the face of a smiling child with its mouth open, open, sucking its thumb. That's 3D, but now they've got 4D. Listen to this, 4D technology. Four-dimensional scans build on the technology of 3D scans. The extra dimension is time. Effectively, 4D ultrasounds are moving images of your baby in real time. Listen. As your baby kicks, moves, frowns, grimaces, sucks their thumb, opens their eyes, moves their lips, you will be able to see these movements on the scan as they are happening. Now just digest that for a moment. Digest it. Think about killing a baby that frowns, moves, grimaces, sucks their thumb. Think about that. And think about the fact that when you see this, you're looking at a perfectly formed little face for its time in the womb. And then there's the day of arrival. What a joyous day. When I was born in 1946, nobody knew what was coming. <laughs> it's a boy! <laughs> and so they went out and they got, got ready for the, for the boy. Today, we know long before that if it's going to be a boy or a girl, don't we? Amen. Yes, we do. So we know how to prepare. But the day of arrival, the mother goes to the hospital. She goes in pregnant. She comes home with a baby. She's got a little human being now, a little person. This little person is now part of her family. Before she had three in her family, four in her family. Now she's got five in her family. Here's a little baby. Now there's the mother's love that immediately pulls that little child to her breast because she loves it. She's carried it for nine months inside her womb. But all the rest of the people around are looking too. And the dad becomes attached to it. But mama is the first one, the first one to have that life, that life within her. And so they come home. Now I understand that sometimes uh, they sleep in the daytime and they wake at night. And I realize that. And I realize that it, uh, some babies get all messed up with the clock. And this is the kind of thing that happens. But that's okay. It's worth it, don't you think? Amen. When you've got a little human being there, you've got a little baby. Now I'm going to give you some wisdom for mothers this morning. Just a little bit. Wisdom for mothers. First of all, love your children. Put them first. Give them mother's love. I can't give a child mother's love. I can give a child dad's love, but not mother's love. I cannot take the place of a mother. A mother cannot take the place of a dad. God meant for a man and a woman to be mother and father to a child. It balances what that child needs. And we, we to this day still don't really understand all that's involved with it. But God had a reason to have a, have a mother and a father. Amen. So love your child. Secondly, don't kill it. Don't kill it. Amen. These people are out here, if you've seen them and demonstrating the last few days, the Supreme Court is simply going to hand down the ruling. If they do, it does not outlaw abortion. It sends it back to the states. And the states make the final decision. Plain words, it puts it into the hands of the people that live in that state. Is that okay? I hear these people screaming about democracy. Democracy. Well, that's democracy. It's the voice of the multitude, right? But that's not what they want. They want an almighty federal government. Let me make no mistake about it. 
every last baby killer walking this earth was born. Somebody let them live. Every last one of them. And there is no blood more innocent. There is no blood more innocent. There is no blood more innocent than the blood of a little baby coming forth from its mother's womb. So don't kill them. Third, teach them. The boys about girls. The girls about boys. Don't you think that's good? Mom knows more about boys than a little child. And mom knows more about girls than the little child. And my friend, that's her place and the place of the father to teach their children, to raise them up in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. They need to teach them about the culture that they're part of. This is 2022, we got American culture, but it's not the same everywhere. When you leave this nation, you'll find out that there's an awful lot of people out there that don't live like we do. There's especially in Eastern Europe, you'll find out that there, this is a big world. And you'll find out that there's a lot of stuff going on in this country that other people get sick of. So teach them how to deal with this culture. They're Americans. Teach them how to deal with American culture. What's that? Transgender and homosexuality and CRT and the rest of it. Racism and all the stuff that goes on in the culture. Teach them how to identify it, deal with it, and move on with their lives. Most importantly, teach them about Christ. Because that's the greatest thing they could ever know. Teach them about the Lord Jesus Christ. And the last thing I want to give you this morning, some quotes. And these are good quotes. These are quotes that are said about mothers. These are things that people said about their mother. One said, a mother's your first friend, your best friend, your forever friend. Another one said, when you're looking at your mother, you're looking at the purest love you will ever know. Amen. Amen. A mother's love. And another one said, mother's the heartbeat in the home. Without her, there seems to be no heartthrob. Mothers are like glue. Even when you can't see them, they're still holding the family together. Oh, boy. My mother, she's beautiful, softened at the edges, tempered with a spine of steel. I want to grow old and be like her. The influence of a mother in the lives of her children is beyond calculation. There is no role in life that is more essential than that of motherhood. And then finally, eloquently, Oliver Wendell Holmes says it this way. Youth fades, love droops, the leaves of friendship fall. A mother's secret hope outlives them all. Another way of saying it is after all the temporal things have come and gone, passed away, there is something that resides in the soul of a mother for her children that has no end that she presses through it, and she wants the best for you. Moms, you want the best for your children, don't you? Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is good. It's a wonderful place that God's given you, mothers. It's a blessed place. It's a gift from God. No man has ever carried a life within him for nine months, but you have. Folks, look at that mother. You lived in her for nine months before you came into this world. She went through the valley of the shadow of death, to give you life. Rachel died. She brought forth Joseph, but then when Benjamin was born, she died on the way to Ephrathah. She called him Ben-Ani. And Jacob said, no, Benjamin, son of my right hand. And so their grave is there to this day. You can, I've seen it. I've been to the tomb. And Jewish women that want children that are barren, they go to that grave site of Rachel. They go there. They go there and they pray, and they ask God to give them children. Ladies, has God given you children? What a blessed honor that you have. Our culture has degenerated to the point to where they, never re they don't even recognize motherhood now. They call it child-bearing people. You see how bad it's getting? Don't let them do you like that. That Bible is thousands of years old. It was around long before America ever showed up. Believe me, it will be around long after America ever existed if the Lord doesn't come back soon. Yes, it will. Mothers, mothers, 
Dedicate your life to the Lord this morning. Your little children need you. They need a love that they can't get in this world. Do you love your children? Consecrate and dedicate your life to him. Father, I pray in Jesus' name for the opportunity this morning to say a few words about motherhood and how important it is because you have designed that. You gave us that. That's what you ordained. And Adam looked at her and said, her name will be Eve, life spring, the mother of all living. So she was. The heads are bowed this morning. I don't want anybody looking, please, but just for a moment, as we come before God, would you raise your hand and say, Preacher, I want to be a better mother. I want to be a better mother. God bless you here. God bless you over there, and God bless you back in the back. I got hands. God bless you over here. God bless you over there. Got hands going up everywhere. I want to be a better mother. Oh, bless your name. Bless the Lord. Thank you, mothers. Thank you, thank you, thank you. How important is a mother? Thank you. Any other mothers in the house today, raise your hand. God bless you back there. God bless you here and over here. Amen. I want to be a better mother. I want to be a better mother. And my motherhood is to my children, not to me, but to them. <coughs> Anybody raise your hand and say, Lord, Jesus, I want to be a better mother. God bless you here. All right, Father. Lord, you know me. I am what I am. But my Heavenly Father, I stand in awe. I have great respect and great love for motherhood. Bless these dear souls. Heavenly Father, answer their prayer today and make them better mothers. Heavenly Father, fill them with the Holy Spirit. God bless the marriages in this house. May they be strengthened. May they be stronger for the children, for the children that you've given to us. In thy name I pray, amen. Stand up, brother. What do we got? Page 394 in the All-American. I surrender all. say just a word to you if God has given you a mother especially a good one before this day is over you should be thanking God for that mother that he gave you because you're here <laughs> you're here you're here you're alive and that is an indication of the kind of mother you had amen amen you're alive you're living. Amen. Father, bless your word and bless these folk. Be with them as they leave out of here today and meet us again this evening, 6 o'clock. In Jesus' name, amen. Be careful, folks. Have a good Mother's Day. Amen.